Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Danielle Fuentes Johnson. I'm a Learning Communities Technical Specialist with the BUILD Initiative, and we're so pleased to have you here with us today. The recent changes in immigration policy are creating new and intense challenges, including increased trauma for infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and their families, as well as the teachers and programs that work with them. With funding from the Irving Harris Foundation, the BUILD Initiative, in partnership with the Center for Law and Social Policy, CLASP, has organized this series of webinars trauma-informed services and policies to support immigrant and mixed-status families in early care and education, as well as a series of blogs intended to help providers, state policy leaders, and advocates work most effectively in this climate. Today's webinar will focus on an overview to immigration policy and trauma. Again, we welcome and are so excited to see the response to this topic. We are presenting in broadcast only mode, which means that you will not be able to ask a question directly, but we very much want your feedback and want to encourage this to be as interactive as possible. In just a moment, we will open the chat box and everyone can see the questions and polls and resources that will be posted in the box. Please feel free to ask any question you may have, and we'll funnel it through to the presenters. Any questions not addressed today, we will capture and circle back on on subsequent webinars. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded, and we will make that available. Throughout the presentation, we'll make the landing pad link available, and the recording will be there later this afternoon. With that, I would like to I would like to introduce our speakers today. Today we have we're honored to have Wendy Wendy Cervantes from CLASP, where she serves as the Director of Immigration and Immigrant Families, the and oversees the organization's cross team work to develop and advocate for policies that support low income immigrants and their families. She's an expert on the cross sector policy issues that impact children of immigrants, including economic security, child welfare, immigration, education, health care, and human rights. Formerly, Ms. Cervantes was the Vice President of Immigration and Child Rights at First Focus, where she established the Center for the Children of Immigrants. Early in her, earlier in her career, Ms. Cervantes worked at the Annie Casey Foundation, where she managed the National Immigrant and Refugee Families and for the D District of Columbia's portfolio. The proud daughter of Mexican immigrants, Ms. Cervantes holds a master's degree in Latin American Studies and Political Science from the University of New Mexico and a bachelor's in Communications from the University of Southern California. Welcome, Wendy. We also want to, we also want to welcome Rebecca Ulrich, who is a policy analyst with CLASP Child Care and Early Education Team. She works to improve access to quality child care and early education programs for young children and low-income families, particularly focusing on the intersection of immigration and early childhood policy. Ms. Ulrich has expertise in child development, qualitative and quantitative research methods, and data analysis. Formerly, Ms. Ulrich was an early, early childhood policy analyst at the Center for American Progress, where her research focused on the early childhood workforce and measures of quality in early care and education programs. Earlier in her career, Ms. Ulrich was a behavioral therapist for young children with autism. She holds a master's degree in applied developmental psychology from George Mason University and a bachelor's degree in human development from Virginia Tech. Welcome, Rebecca. And we also are honored to have with us Candace Thomas, who is a senior program officer at the Irving Harris Foundation, where she leads the effort to build developmentally appropriate trauma-informed equitable systems of care for young children and their families. She manages grants and projects in infant and early childhood mental health and child trauma, domestic violence, and reproductive health and justice, as well as a network of national and international grantees working in infant and early childhood mental health training and leadership development in the United States and Israel, a leader in the creation of the diversity informed tenants for work with infants, children, and families. She facilitates workshops and trainings to infuse diversity and inclusion practices into organizations and systems. 
Candice is a PhD candidate in child development at the Erickson Institution, Loyola University, where she researches the use of mindfulness as a practice to buffer intergenerational trauma transmission within families. Welcome, Candice. On today's session, we're going to be honored to hear from CLASP as they discuss and give us an overview of immigration policy and trauma first by discussing immigrant families and immigration context in the United States, the impact of policy changes on children, what can ECE stakeholders do, and then we'll ask Ms. Thomas to give us an overview of the diversity-informed tenants for work with infants, children, and families. We'll have time for questions, and then we'll discuss what's next. Before I turn the program over to our colleagues at CLASP, we want to take a moment to see who's on the call. You can take a minute to answer the poll and let us know if your work is primarily legislative, state agency, advocacy, philanthropy, programs for families and children, direct care service providers such as a home visitor, early intervention, or child care, or something that we didn't capture. Please enter it in the chat box. And with that, I'll invite Rebecca to the podium. Thanks, Danielle. And uh, thanks so much to you for, uh, for having us on the webinar. We're really um, excited to be here with all of you today. Um, so before we get started with content, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about CLASP for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Uh, CLASP is a national, nonpartisan anti-poverty organization located in Washington, D.C. We have expertise across a variety of policy areas, including income and work supports, job quality issues, workforce development and higher education, opportunity use, immigration and immigrant families, and child care and early education. CLASP works to develop and implement federal, state, and local policies that reduce poverty, improve low-income people's lives, and create pathways to economic security for everyone. That includes directly addressing the barriers people face because of race, ethnicity, and immigration status. We also fight back against bad ideas as well as political attacks on effective policies and investments. So as Danielle said, we're going to get started by giving an overview of the characteristics of children and immigrant families and share some information about recent immigration policy changes that are affecting young children. We'll then discuss how these policy changes impact the health, development, and economic security of children and their caregivers before turning to recommendations and next steps for early childhood stakeholders. In 2017, 44 million immigrants were residing in the United States, accounting for roughly 14% of the total population, the highest share since 1910. As the population of foreign-born residents grows, so too does the number of children who are members of immigrant families. Today, one in four young children, nearly six million children under the age of six, have one or more immigrant parents. The vast majority of young children with immigrant parents are themselves U.S.-born citizens, and most live with parents who have some form of lawful status or who are naturalized U.S. citizens. A smaller but sizable share have one or more parents who are undocumented. Counter to claims from the current administration, the total number of undocumented immigrants is currently at its lowest level in more than a decade. However, it's also important to note that immigration status is somewhat fluid. Many undocumented immigrants currently living in the United States arrived legally, but overstayed their visas and became undocumented. Conversely, some immigrants come to the United States without documentation, but obtain lawful status over time. And many lawfully present immigrants become U.S. citizens through naturalization. Children with immigrant parents are overwhelmingly children of color and continue to be a major contributor to the rapidly increasing racial and ethnic diversity in the young child population. As you can see on the slide, about half of all children in immigrant families are Hispanic or Latinx of any race, compared to one quarter of the overall child population. 17% of children in immigrant families are non-Hispanic Asian, compared to just 5% of the overall young child population. Notably, Asian Americans are one of the fastest growing racial groups in the United States, 
growth that is driven largely by immigration. Children and immigrant families live in communities all over the country. Their share of the young child population varies somewhat by state, as you can see on the slide here, ranging from 44% in California to just 3% in West Virginia. Traditional immigrant destinations like California, New York, Florida, and Texas continue to have relatively higher shares of young children with immigrant parents. But states like North Carolina, Nebraska, Tennessee, and Georgia have experienced greater overall growth in the population of children and immigrant families over the course of the last decade. There is also some state and regional variability in the share of children and immigrant families across all age groups by parents' nationality. For example, states in the West and Southwest have somewhat higher concentrations of children with parents from Mexico, while states on the East Coast have slightly higher concentrations of, parent, of children with parents from Central or South America. It's important for early childhood stakeholders to understand the demographics of children and immigrant families in your state and community, as families' countries of origin, legal immigration status, home language, and racial, ethnic, and cultural identities influence their children's access to and experiences in early care and education. These characteristics also affect how their families are experiencing recent policy changes. I'll turn it over to Wendy now to discuss those policy changes in more detail. Thank you, Becca, and good morning or good afternoon to all of you on the line. Um, as you all know, there have been a lot of immigration policies implemented and proposed over the past two years with major implications for immigrant families, which we can think of as falling into three interrelated categories, which include heightened immigration enforcement at the border and in the interior, the removal of protections for immigrants previously granted some sort of discretion, and the undercutting of immigrants' access to health care and public benefits. Collectively, these policies seek to not only drastically cut immigration to the U.S., including closing the door on asylum seekers, but also to ignite a sense of constant fear and uncertainty and ultimately make life as difficult as possible for immigrants and their families in the U.S., including those that are lawfully present. And it's also important to note that even when they aren't the targets of immigration policies, children are often adversely affected. So the first area I'll go deeper on is um, incre the increase in immigration enforcement. Um, as many of you know, shortly after Trump took office, he issued two executive orders that ramped up immigration enforcement across the board, including a significant increase in the number of immigration agents on the border and the interior of the U.S. One of the executive orders made every undocumented immigrant a priority for deportation, including parents who had previously been granted discretion under the enforcement priorities of the previous administration. This means that many more children are now vulnerable to being separated from their parents as a result of detention or deportation. And over the past two years, we've seen more cases of parents detained by authorities when going in to comply with their annual check-in with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. And we've also seen a significant increase in detention bed capacity, including for children and families, with the number of people in immigration detention now at historic highs. We've also seen a revival of large-scale raids, including worksite raids, which have a serious impact on children and families, as well as the schools and other programs that serve them. For example, in the large raid, large raid that took place in Morristown, Tennessee last year, not only were several parents arrested, but the next day approximately 600 children did not show up for school. Finally, the administration has also sought to expand partnerships between local police and ICE in an, in an effort to enforce immigration law, which research shows creates a heightened sense of fear and breaks down trust between immigrant communities and law enforcement. At the state level, such as in Texas, there have also been state laws passed that also seek to ramp up this type of enforcement um, collaboration. And while we won't focus on the border today, we do at least want to flag the harsh enforcement-heavy approach the administration has taken in an effort to deter asylum seekers and other vulnerable migrants from entering through the southwest border, the majority of whom are families and children. This includes the horrifying zero-tolerance policy last summer that led to this traumatic separation of thousands of children from their parents, as well as recent efforts to turn asylum seekers away at the border and expand the use of family detention, all policies which jeopardize the safety and well-being of children. 
Second, the administration has also attempted to remove protections for immigrants previously granted discretion. This includes the decision in September of 2017 to terminate the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA, a program that was established in 2012 to provide work authorization and protection from deportation and has provided this protection to nearly 800,000 people who entered the U.S. as children. While court challenges have prevented the administration from revoking DACA protections from those who have it, beneficiaries continue to live with uncertainty and the program is no longer accepting new applications. This decision is harmful to DACA recipients as well as their families. One study shows that one in four DACA recipients is a parent to a U.S. citizen child. It also harms the prospects for relief um, and future educational opportunities for many young dreamers who are turning 15 and would have been eligible to apply for DACA had the program not been terminated. In fact, just today a new report was released showing that approximately 100,000 undocumented youth graduate from high school in the U.S. every year. Another example is the decision to cancel Temporary Protected Status, or TPS, for thousands of TPS holders, many of whom have been in the U.S. for decades and have long established roots in their communities. An estimated 273,000 TPS holders from El Salvador, Honduras, and Haiti are parents to U.S. citizen children, and these families now face the possibility of separation, and once again, the uncertainty remains as these cases move through the courts. It is also worth noting that many DACA and TPS holders are part of the early childhood workforce. And finally, the administration continues to seek to weaken protections for vulnerable, unaccompanied children who enter the U.S. alone, such as exposing them to indefinite detention, once again, in a misguided effort to deter future migration. And finally, much in the same way that there have been constant attacks at the federal level on health care and other safety net programs for low-income families generally, there have also been targeted efforts through both legislation and the regulatory process to cut off immigrants and their families from accessing critical health and nutrition supports. One example I'll discuss in more detail is the administration's proposed rule on public charge, a term many of you are likely familiar with. The rule was published in the Federal Register in October of last year and would essentially make it harder for certain immigrants to enter the U.S. to reunify with family or for immigrants already here to achieve long-term permanent status, which is critical for family stability and economic mobility. First, let me step back and flag that public charge is a term that has been used for more than 100 years in immigration law to describe a person who is deemed likely to become primarily dependent on the government as their primary source of support. It is based on a totality of circumstances test looking at a range of factors such as age, health, income, education, and sometimes an affidavit of support from a sponsor and the use of certain public benefits. Right now, just cash assistance such as SSI or TANF and long-term care at government expense. A public charge determination is made in two instances, when an individual is seeking to enter the U.S. with a visa or when an individual is applying for lawful permanent residence or a green card. It's not relevant when an individual applies to become a U.S. citizen, and it does not apply to certain categories of immigrants, including refugees, asylees, and others. The proposed rule would drastically alter current policy in three different ways. First, it would change the definition of who is a public charge to an immigrant who receives one or more public benefits. This is a drastic shift from the original intent of the policy to identify someone who is primarily dependent on the government for their main source of support to someone who may use a public benefit even for a short period of time. The rule also creates a more complex set of factors that need to be considered when determining who is a public charge as part of that totality of circumstances test, which would now essentially become a wealth test that would ultimately make it much harder for low-income and working-class families to overcome, regardless of whether or not they have access to public benefits. The test also now weighs certain factors more heavily than others, with more negative factors than positive ones. Examples of negative factors include age, being too young or too old, as well as having one or more children to support a health condition and not being able to speak English. The threshold for a family of four to overcome the public charge test without any additional scrutiny would be a household income of at least $64,000 a year, a very high threshold that only one in three native-born Americans would be able to meet. 
And the third major change is that the rule would also expand the list of benefit programs that could make someone a public charge from cash assistance, such as SSI and TANF, and long-term care at government expense, um, to include non-emergency Medicaid, SNAP, housing assistance, as well as the subsidies for prescription drug costs under Medicare Part D. Also, to be really clear, the rule states that a program that is not specifically listed in the rule would not make someone a public charge. So, for example, programs like Head Start and WIC are not included under the rule, and therefore use of those programs would not make someone a public charge should the rule be finalized or now. It's also important to remember that only an individual's own benefit use would be considered under the proposal. This is different from earlier leaked versions of the rule and means that the use of benefits by U.S. citizen children will not impact the parent's public charge test. However, for immigrant children, their own benefit use counts towards their own public charge determination. I want to reiterate that the rule has not been finalized, so current public charge policy stands. The rule was published in October, and during the 60-day comment period, the Protecting Immigrant Families campaign, which is co-chaired by CLASP, was able to help drive more than 260,000 public comments, the majority in opposition to the rule, and many comments submitted by early childhood stakeholders. By law, the administration is supposed to read and consider every single comment before finalizing the rule. But it's really clear, uh, but, but it's really actually unclear as to when the rule may be finalized. And we will be continuing to monitor the situation closely and work with our partners to try to delay its finalization. Nonetheless, we know from our partners on the ground and from our own research that the chilling effect has already had an impact on, on benefit use. For more information on how the rule impacts early childhood programs, you can refer to the FAQ document that CLASP has shared as part of today's resources and also visit the protectingimmigrantfamilies.org website to get up-to-date materials, including guides for how to talk to immigrants about the policy. And I will stop there and turn it back to Becca. And before we move on to the next section of the presentation, we're going to do another quick poll. Um, so you can submit your answers on this uh, slide right here. Uh, and the question is, what resources or information would be helpful to you in your work? Uh, would you, and you can choose um, all of the resources that apply. So do you need information about children and immigrant families in your community, immigration lawyers in your area, immigration, immigrant serving organizations in your area, uh, more information about public charge, information about um, DACA and TPS, including um, uh, upcoming federal legislation on that front? Um, do you want information about how to safeguard early childhood programs from immigration enforcement? And are you looking for information about helping families prepare for the possibility of deportation? And if there's um, other information or resources that you're looking for that we don't mention here, um, please just submit those in the chat box. So we're now going to turn to an overview of the research on how young children are being impacted by these immigration policy changes that Wendy just described. So the next few slides focus on findings from class field research with child care and early education providers and immigrant parents in six states, which you can find in our two reports that are linked on the BUILD landing page and on CLASP's website. We also share find, uh, findings from recent research conducted by some of our partners in this work as well. So one of the most consistent things that we heard from parents and providers is that children and their families are afraid. We heard that children as young as three years old are expressing fears related to the possibility of being separated from their parents. They're worried about their parents' safety, but they're also wondering who will take care of them if their parent is deported. Providers indicated that children's distress was evident in behaviors such as self-harm, increased aggression, and increased withdrawal. Providers could not always attribute the specific cause of the changes they observed, but teachers with long tenures in the field describe children's behavior as markedly different from children in previous years. Some providers described especially alarming behaviors, such as a five-year-old boy whose anxiety was so severe that he was biting his fingertips to the point that they were bleeding. Notably, our conversations with parents and providers suggest that it's not just children with undocumented parents who are experiencing this constant worry. 
Elevated fear extended to children whose parents have lawful immigration status, even children whose parents are U.S. citizens. This just reflects the fact that young children don't understand the nuances of immigration status, but they are paying attention, they're listening, and they're internalizing what they see and hear. However, the very real threat of family separation makes children with parents who are undocumented at the greatest risk of health and developmental concerns. The uptick in recent worksite raids mean more children may be questioning whether their parents will be there when they get home from school. With heightened arrest in communities, more children are vulnerable to witnessing traffic stops or being present during a home raid, which typically take place between 3 and 5 a.m. So you can just imagine what it would be like to be a young child and to be woken up um, by immigration agents entering your home. Providers describe children who experience the deportation of a parent or who witnessed an enforcement action of some kind, refusing to talk, having toileting accidents, spontaneously crying, and becoming clingy with the remaining parent in the aftermath of deportation. These stories echo existing research showing that children with undocumented parents are more likely than their peers with parent, um, whose parents have some form of lawful status to display signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. Families are also increasingly concerned about enrolling their children in publicly funded programs and services. They're worried about sharing their private information, how participating in these programs could affect their ability to obtain long-term status, and the possibility of encountering immigration agents. Providers indicated that parents are more reluctant to enroll or maintain enrollment in programs like WIC, SNAP, and Medicaid for their U.S. citizen children now than they have ever been in the past. This is consistent with media reports and research from others in the field indicating that the climate of fear generated by heightened enforcement and other anti-immigrant proposals, like the public charge rule Wendy mentioned earlier, are contributing to shifting patterns of enrollment in these public services. For example, a March 2018 survey from the National WIC Association revealed that nearly two-thirds of providers surveyed across 18 different states reported declines in WIC enrollment of up to 20%. A recent study from the Boston Medical Center found that after 10 years of increasing participation in SNAP, enrollment among immigrant families declined in the first half of 2018. And the Georgetown Center for Children and Families reported late last year that the share of children who are uninsured increased for the first time in 2017 since they began tracking this data in 2008. Some providers indicated that even when they can assure families it's safe to enroll in these programs, Families are taking every precaution that they can to avoid immigration agents and are limiting the time they spend out in their community. Providers said that some parents are skipping well child visits, prenatal care visits, and even therapy appointments for children with special needs. In Pennsylvania, parents shared that they were hesitant to take their children to the emergency room because ICE patrols the route to the hospital. Early childhood providers we spoke with also reported significant drops in attendance immediately following the election, major policy announcements, and after real or rumored home or worksite raids in their communities. Some programs found that children stopped coming altogether, and many reported that they were struggling to recruit new families. One pre-K program said that they received close to 100 fewer new applicants in the spring of 2017 compared to the previous year. It's no surprise then that parents are under incredible pressure to continue supporting their families as they deal with the stress of this uncertain and unrelenting policy climate. Providers and parents described families limiting when, where, and how far they drive, making everyday tasks like going to work or to the grocery store complicated and time consuming, particularly in communities with limited transportation options. One provider shared that she knew of families who traded off going grocery shopping. One mom went to the store while another stayed home with all of the children, just in case ICE was patrolling the route. We heard stories of undocumented immigrant parents who switched into lower paying, informal employment because they were worried about the possibility of worksite raids or because their employers had preemptively laid them off from jobs they'd held for decades. Parents are also dealing with the stress of trying to prepare for the possibility of their families being separated either due to their own deportation or that of a spouse or family member. They are also having to grapple with difficult decisions about whether their children will go with a deported parent or who can care for them if they remain in the United States. 
One mom in New Mexico said, my young daughter tells me, why are these people coming for us? And she asks me questions I don't know how to answer. I'm not going to tell them that we can be deported at any moment. They are from here. They don't even know what that means. The early childhood providers we spoke with are also feeling worried and overwhelmed by the current context. Many felt underprepared to meet families' needs and not having expertise in immigration issues were worried about being able to give parents information that was accurate and up to date. Providers said parents were coming to them with new concerns and requests for information, such as mental health and stress management, free or pro bono legal services, information on immigration policy changes and know your rights, and information on creating a family safety plan and power of attorney. Providers working directly with families spoke with great emotion about how difficult their jobs had become. Most illustrative of the emotional demands on providers was the common experience of being asked by a parent to take care of their child in the event that they were arrested or deported. In many cases, the families that uh, providers were serving don't have relatives in the United States, and the parents perceived their home visitor or family support worker as someone that they could trust to care for their child in their absence. Many of the staff members and programs we visited were immigrants themselves, as Wendy alluded to earlier. And so they're experiencing the impacts of immigration policy changes both personally and professionally. Providers of differing religious and ethnic backgrounds, legally residing immigrants, and U.S. citizens all expressed concerns about how people in their communities perceived them and voiced fear about increased racism and xenophobia. Several programs employed DACA recipients who are worried about how the President's decision to terminate the program will allow them to continue their ability to work and further their education in this incredibly important field. We know from decades of developmental research that children's experiences in the first few years of life set the stage for future health and development. Any policy that threatens to separate children from their parents limits their access to healthy food and medical care, puts undue stress on their mental health and that of their parents, and undermines their family's economic security, poses a direct threat to their well-being with long-term consequences into adulthood. There is no denying that immigration policy is a children's issue. And those of us who are invested in programs and policies that support children's health and development must be prepared to speak out and to take action. I'll turn it back over to Wendy. Thanks, Becca. And I see um, some questions already about how to take action. One person asked um, how they could specifically help to um, delay the public charge rule from taking effect. And once again, I would encourage folks to visit the ProtectingMigrantFamilies.org website because there will be um, uh, um, opportunities highlighted. Um, where, and you can also sign up for a listserv to get um, up to date action opportunities. Um, and then I would also flag that um, one of the things that's really important um, is documenting impact, which we'll cover in more detail. So as um, Becca stated, there's, a, there's, there's lots of things you can do. And first of all, I want to stress that you don't have to be an immigration expert to be an advocate for children and immigrant families, and that your perspective and voice as a provider or an early childhood stakeholder is incredibly powerful. So we do encourage you to speak out against harmful federal and state policies. This can be in the form of op-eds, issue briefs that are focused on immigrant children and families in your, in your state, as well as, once again, sharing firsthand, firsthand accounts of the widespread impact of policies that seek to undermine immigrants' access to health and nutrition supports like public charge, and why increased immigration enforcement, the deportation of parents, and the removal of protections like DACA and TPS holders, how this destabilizes families and communities. Early childhood providers and stakeholders are also perfect spokespeople who can not only share firsthand stories of impact, but also drive values-based messages that put children first. And we also encourage you, once again, to help document the impact, as we did with our own research, to help paint a picture of what these policies mean for the everyday lives of children and families in your communities and also to help identify strategies for better serving families. In addition to fighting back on harmful policies, we also encourage you to help advance a positive agenda where possible, particularly at the state and local level. We do know that this very much largely depends on the political context of where you live. 
but this can include advocating for local education and so social service agencies to issue guidance on current immigrant eligibility for early childhood and public assistance programs, as well as, well as proactively communicating about policy changes, such as if the public charge rule is finalized sometime in the future. You can also help advance legislation that supports immigrants' safety, health, economic security, and educational opportunities, such as laws that would provide driver's licenses to undocumented workers or expand access to publicly funded health care for immigrant children and pregnant women. At the federal level, I also wanted to flag that there is legislation moving right now, the Dream and Promise Act, which would provide a path to citizenship for DACA beneficiaries and other DREAMers, as well as TPS holders. Finally, we recommend you create an intentional focus on children of immigrants at the program level, which, in, which can include that making sure that families know that your program is a welcoming and safe, safe place. One way to do this is to reevaluate program application and enrollment procedures and, figure, and ask questions like, are, these, um, are you collecting information that's um, unnecessary that might scare families away? Have you informed parents that your place is safe from ICE enforcement actions? And Becca will cover strategies on this in more detail in just a moment. You can also develop partnerships with immigrant serving organizations, legal service providers, and mental health experts in your community to help connect families to these resources. You can also be proactive in making resources about immigrant rights immigration policy and immigrant eligibility for public assistance programs and other benefits available and accessible to all families so that families don't have to wait to feel comfortable to divulge that they might be in need of such resources. And you can consider offering trainings on Know Your Rights and how to make a family deportation emergency plan for staff and parents on site. So one particular uh, policy or programmatic change that you, uh, that you can make that we really want to focus on um, is the implementation of so-called safe space policies that safeguard your locations against immigration enforcement and protect parents and staff members' private information. So some of you may be familiar with the Department of Homeland Security's sensitive locations policy, which restricts immigration enforcement actions in places like schools, hospitals, and churches. Known and licensed child care programs, preschools, pre-kindergarten programs, Head Start programs, and other early childhood programs fall under the definition of schools for the purposes of this policy. This means that, except in limited circumstances, immigration agents are prohibited from conducting enforcement actions at these locations. The sensitive locations policy remains in place under this administration, but anecdotal evidence suggests that it isn't being con enforced consistently or at best is being interpreted very narrowly. Several early childhood providers we spoke with reported instances of potential violations of the sensitive locations policy, circumstances in which a parent was detained on the sidewalk outside of a program in front of his children, um, or a parent being uh, arrested in a parking lot. Um, and many of the providers that we spoke with weren't aware that they could take steps to stop this these kinds of actions from happening and didn't know that they were protected by the sensitive locations policy. So for this reason, we have been developing a resource and encourage programs to have a policy that designates your facility as a safe space from immigration enforcement. Safe space policies are rooted in existing privacy and security protocols and help programs prepare for possible enforcement actions at or near your location. These policies also demonstrate that you care about families' well-being and are taking steps to ensure their safety and privacy, even if no such enforcement action should occur. We just released our Safe Space Guide uh, yesterday, um, and we are available to provide technical assistance for programs who are interested in developing policies of your own. We also have a one-page fact sheet on the sensitive locations policy for early childhood programs and parents. Both of these resources are available on our website as well as on the, uh, the build landing pad for this webinar. And that's it from us. Um, so before I turn it back over, I just want to make a note that CLASP is really committed to giving early childhood stakeholders, whether you're a direct service provider, a systems leader, a program administrator, a policymaker, or an advocate, the necessary tools and resources to support immigrant families in your program. We've developed some resources on that front, which Wendy and I have mentioned throughout the presentation today. 
Um, and you can find those on the webinar landing pad, and there are many more available on CLASP's website. If you have questions that we don't end up being able to answer today or are looking for other resources or information, please don't hesitate to reach out to Wendy or me via email. And I'll turn it back over to you, Danielle. Fantastic. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Rebecca, so much for that presentation. We have a lot of questions. There were, and we want you to know as participants in this webinar that we heard you. We have captured the questions that you submitted prior to um, the session during registration, and we see the questions you have today. We are planning to circle back with those questions if they do not um, get receive an answer this afternoon. Um, and keep coming back to those questions. Please keep submitting them. We're going to take just a few minutes for one or two questions right now, and then we'll introduce the next portion of our session today. But I want to ask Wendy and Rebecca, one question that came up a lot was how to talk about the issue without inciting political debate. Yeah, that's, um, that's a tricky one, but we do, we do really think that leading with children first, and particularly the fact that many of the children that are being impacted by the anti-immigrant policies in the interior are U.S. citizen children, um, we think is one of the um, best ways. And of course, that you know the messaging um, advice is always to lead with values-based messaging, and children are core to um, you know making sure that every child is protected and has. Um, it is connected to the resources they need to thrive is very much an American value. And so um, that is, is one recommendation that we make. Yeah, I, I, I would just kind of underscore that um, we really want to talk about it in terms of the impacts of these policies. You know, things like maintaining family unity, um, making sure children have enough food to eat and can get medical care, those are not political issues. That, um, these are about real children's lives. Um, and, and the future of our country. Um, and so, um, like Wendy said, really leading with values, um, centering it around children's development. Um, and, and we, uh, a lot of our resources can help provide that framing for you um, if you're looking for um, kind of more specific research or, um, or uh, statements on that front. Um, it can also be helpful to tie some of these, um, this policy-induced trauma to the other sort of buzzwords that we often hear from policymakers, things like adverse childhood experiences, toxic stress. You know, I think those are words that have really kind of permeated policymakers' thinking. They know what that means. And so if we can draw connections to family separation, loss of access to, to public benefits to those um, traumatic experiences, um, we can also um, sort of make the case that way. Well, thank you so much. We have a lot more questions, a lot of wonderful, insightful questions, and we will circle back and make sure that we respond to those as well. Right now, we're going to pause for just a moment before we um, move to our next speaker. And given, given the landscape we've just heard about, how exactly how, how and where do we turn for supporting children and families um, in this immigration context? Um, where do you turn? What, what tools and resources are you looking at right now? So before we turn the, the conversation over to Candace Thomas, we're asking, do you use a resource guideline or framework for supporting diverse children and families and the providers that serve them? So if you can indicate on the next slide yes or no, and if yes, please share that resource in the chat box, and then we'll invite Candace Thomas to, to the, our discussion. We're going to leave the chat box open for about one more minute to make sure we capture as many responses as possible. All right. 
With that, we'd like to invite Candace Thomas to tell us about the trauma informed services and policies, or excuse me, the introduction to diversity informed practices and the diversity informed tenants for work with infants, children, and families. Welcome, Candace. Thank you, Danielle. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to see that there are about 300 people out there across the time zones that are logged into the website and to the webinar. Um, this has been Rebecca and Wendy. That was such an incredible overview and presentation, and we really could have used the whole webinar hearing from you and learning more. So thank you for um, letting me join. Um, a lot of what Rebecca and Wendy said just now actually really relates very strongly to diversity-informed practice and to the diversity-informed tenants. You talked about really the impact of federal policy and its impact on children and families that, that the policies are targeted to impact, but also how federal policies impact us all, people in the community, people who are working with children and families. So really that extends to the tenants and thinking about how our systems that, are, that have been created to provide services can end up being systems of oppression for all of us. You also really showed us and demonstrated for us how we can all be advocates for children and families that are dealing with the federal immigration system and related to the tenants that really bridges to the tenants because the tenants really try to remind us and encourage us to be very intentional with action in order to create change. And so what you did in your slides, in addition to your overview, was linked beautifully to the diversity informed tenants, so thank you. So I'm Candace Thomas, I'm with the Irving Harris Foundation. I am honored to introduce you to diversity informed practice and to the diversity informed tenants for work with infants, children, and families. Um, the tenants are not my work alone, so I just want to acknowledge that there are a few tenants colleagues that I believe are logged in to the webinar today, and you will hear more about the tenants going forward, as I know this is the first of a few webinars on this topic. I also want to thank CLASP and BUILD for bringing the webinar forward and for the Irving Harris Foundation, the organization I work for, but especially my colleague Denise Castillo de la Sola, who really had the vision for the webinar and uh, many of this, much of this work that the foundation does focus on this topic. So we asked you to share if you use any kind of frameworks or um, code of ethics as you think about work that helps guide your practice. And there were, I didn't get the count of people who said, yes or no, but I see in our chat box that folks are saying that they use parent trainings using Strengthening Families. I see the National Child Traumatic Stress Network resources as something that people are using. I see Bridging Refugee Youth and Children's Services resources listed here. So this is really helpful and it gives us a sense of what guides our practice to work with children and families impacted by the federal immigration policies currently, but overall what helps guide our practice as we work with or on behalf of young children and their families in general. What I note here is that there are many things, there are many codes of ethics or frameworks that can really guide our practice and, who, that, and that can really help inspire our work so that we can provide the highest level of services for families. And what I hope I do today is inspire you to use diversity and form practice and the tenants as another resource to guide your practice. So the diversity informed tenants are rooted in what we call diversity informed practice. And diversity informed practice is, is a dynamic system of beliefs and values that are ever changing, therefore dynamic, and they're shaped by how we are with ourselves and how we are with others. This practice recognizes all of the influences that shape our beliefs, including historical and contemporary salience of race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, age, ableism, homophobia, I'll also say here nationality, 
and other systems of oppression that we live in and are impacted by. Ultimately, diversity-informed practice strives for the highest possible standard of inclusivity in all forms and all spheres of practice. The tenants are a set of guiding principles or a framework. So hopefully it's a framework that you will begin to include to help inspire you as some of the frameworks you list here. They, it's a framework that we hope raises awareness of inequities and injustices embedded in our society. And it's a framework that hopes to empower individuals, organizations, and systems of care to identify and address social justice issues intertwined with all of our work. So as you may know, the tenants are not a cultural competency tool or any kind of toolkit or explicit know-how to work with a certain group of people. But rather, we offer the tenants as a stance, a way of being and a navigational tool. You can download the tenants from our website. They're also on the Build Landing page. Uh, the tenants on our website are open source, so it can be downloaded as many times as you wish. Um, we hope that you really use the tenants, as I said earlier, to really inspire your work and to um, offer you another framework to help shape how you're thinking about your work with children and families, in this case impacted by current immigration policies. We have been told that the tenants are a reminder to encourage the examination of privilege and more intentional and cons more of privilege more intentional and consistently, and also the exploration of non-dominant bodies of knowledge as we delicately explore possible useful inter interventions with families. We hope the tenants strive to empower you, your organizations, and your programs to work for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We do this by facilitating spaces and providing tools for people to engage in diversity-informed practice really through self-transformation. We believe that our work is shaped and squarely rooted in self-transformation, and therefore our values are consistent with this, including the first value of self-reflection and curiosity. With this, we are working towards building a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable organization, and believe that this starts with aspiration, intentional practice, some of what Wendy and Becca talked about earlier, and individual and collective commitment. So that commitment and our intentional action will lead us to change. So many of you who have done any work or study w involving young children's social emotional development or infant mental health have really thought about reflexive capacity and self-awareness and what you bring to your work. And this is consistent with the diversity informed tenants. Our grounding principle is around self-awareness because we believe that there is no change, no change can happen for families and children without beginning with ourselves. So our work in diversity informed practice begins with us and not the other. And so we hope the tenants inspire you to make the commitment for intentional change for young children, and in particular right now, young children and families that are being targeted with the federal immigration policies. Diversity informed practice ultimately is shaped by who we are, how curious we are, committed and intentional about change. So really this work with or on behalf of families at the border begins with you. So we hope the tenants can be not only a framework and navigational tool or a bench card to help navigate your work with families, but really remind you of, of some of the individual, programmatic, and organizational changes you can make to prioritize diversity and farm practice. We know the tenants can help you acknowledge how systems of oppression impacts us all, whether, whether or not oppression is targeted toward us. And we hope the tenants make explicit connections for you 
between your work and the sociocultural context. And really, Becca and Wendy's slides just really highlight this for us. And ultimately, we hope that the tenants empower you to explicitly work towards social justice. We've been told that after participating in one of our workshops, that this person said that she felt, he or she felt, more practicing more self-awareness when working with clients. And this person chose their words carefully and in, to ensure that they're not using words that hurt, but words that are used to heal. Another person told us that using the tenants, that they are now talking with their social work interns and staff more, o more often and directly about implicit bias and systems of oppression in a global sense as they relate to us as practitioners with children and their families. So I hope that this inspires you a little bit to learn more. You can learn more by visiting our website, which is listed here, as well as I said, the tenants on the build landing page. I know that this is the first of a few webinars on this topic, and I know that the next webinar um, includes a, a, a close colleague and friend and dear tenants collaborator, Carmen Rosa Noronha, and she will talk more explicitly about how the tenants can help enhance your practice. And if you want any other information on the diversity informed tenants, my colleague Amanda Hu is available and you can contact her as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Candice. I am, I am taking away the, the morsel of the back of my mind that the change depends on how curious and how intentional we are. So thank you for planting that seed and giving us an overview of the tenants which will help inform the, the upcoming sessions. Right now I want to pause for just a minute before we talk about what's next and open it up for a few minutes for questions related to the tenants or related to the presentation of the overview. Let's see. Um, Take a look. Um, so one question relate, that we have that's related to the overview was there was a question regarding public charge does not apply to refugees, asylees, and some others. Can you say just a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. So there's always been some um, categories of immigrants that are been that have been exempt from the public charge. Um, determination, and that, as you mentioned, includes refugees um, and people who are asylees, um, and also those who um, are applying um, for a green card under the Violence Against Women Act, or people who have been applying through a U or T visa, as well as children that are seeking special immigrant juvenile status, and then there's a couple other vulnerable populations. Um, and those um, categories, once again, are, are spelled out in um, either our FAQ document or, or yeah. yeah, they're in our FAQ document yeah. if you need to learn more. Fantastic. Another question we have in several different versions is that of safe spaces. Um, you mentioned libraries. There's a question whether CCRNRs or family resource centers are also considered safe spaces. Can you give us just a, what our appetite's a little more for what we'll find in the, in the new release? Well, one thing I just want to clarify is that there is there is a, um, a sensitive locations um, policy under Immigration and Customs Enforcement that, that calls these um, where so that term sensitive locations is under it comes from the existing policy on areas that ICE considers um, places where they restrict access um, for, to immigration um, enforcement agents um, because they're quote unquote sensitive locations. Um, the safe space. Um, term is something that's a little bit more encompassing and something that we're aspiring to encourage there to be more locations that are safe spaces, but that's not necessarily something that's under the existing policy. Um, I'll let Becca touch on the um, what some of the specific questions on that. Yeah, so um, the sensitive locations policy, like Wendy said, is, is um, under Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and it's right now, um, it's just agency guidance, so it's not, um, it's not codified into law. Um, so the, the types of places that are covered by the sensitive locations policy are schools, and as I said, that includes known and licensed early childhood programs, 
Um, it also includes you know, elementary, middle, and high schools. It includes colleges and universities. Um, and it includes um, after school programs um, and school bus stops. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the policy also includes um, hospitals, healthcare facilities, doctor's offices, um, you know, any kind of, um, uh, of office providing healthcare services. It includes um, churches, synagogues, other places of worship. It includes um, public demonstrations, so like marches or rallies. Um, and it includes um, uh, weddings, funerals, and other um, uh, religious or civil celebrations. Um, and so uh, that, that is the policy as it exists um, under agency guidance. So the safe space policy that we mentioned um, is, is actually a, um, a policy that's initiated by an individual program or if you fall under a school district or other kind of um, oversight agency, um, that uh, programs can implement in order to sort of um, lay out a set of protocols um, for what you would do if an immigration agent came to your facility to conduct an enforcement action either against a parent or potentially a staff member. Um, so I'm sure many of you on the call are familiar with the, with the idea of sanctuary school policies um, where schools will not cooperate with immigration enforcement. Um, safe space policies are effectively the, the early childhood version um, for, for our purposes um, of those sanctuary school policies. That said, um, other organizations that are not early childhood programs can also implement policies or protocols to safeguard their locations from immigration enforcement. Um, and we'd be happy to answer kind of more specific information about um, how you can go about doing that, what some of the um, the, the laws and policies are that, that back those policies up um, if you want to reach out to us um, via email. And the last thing I would flag is that there is legislation right now that class and other partners are working to advance called the Pre Protecting Sensitive Locations Act that would not only codify the existing agency guidance that um, Becca flagged, but would also expand it to include places like libraries that are not currently listed under the, the agency guidance, um, as well as other locations that we think are critical to, to add to the definition. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. We're going to need to pause just for a minute so we can talk about what's next. And so once again, Candace, thank you so much for giving the, us a, a preview of the tenants a very complicated um, or requires a, a full day um, of, of engagement to get a full sense of, but we so appreciate you giving us that taste and whetting our appetite. In the next session we have, we have started today to um, the process of investigating how self-awareness leads to better services for families. In our next upcoming web webinars, we'll continue to reference the tenants as we start to understand how the importance of understanding and supporting families and young children experiencing this very unique and un unyielding immigration trauma and listening to and supporting providers that care for this vulnerable population. So the next session that we have scheduled is on May 23rd, and it is on specifically the impacts of immigration trauma on the health and development of young children, what that looks like, and how providers can support those families and children. And we will be um, honored to have Carmen Rosa Norona and Ivis Fernandez Pastrana um, speak to that, to that topic. So we hope to see you there, and we will be link for that webinar will be found in the chat box as well as on the landing pad. There we go. And then come after that webinar and we will follow it with a trauma-informed approach to working with providers and families, how providers can maintain self-care while they are working with this vulnerable population. And then in the fourth webinar, we'll invite, our, we'll invite our colleagues from class back to speak to promising practices and strategies for policy and legislation. Um, so we look forward to that. Again, today, I so want to thank our speakers, Candice, Rebecca, Wendy, for taking time out of your day to share with us this information. 
You can visit the landing pad for resources mentioned during today's presentation, additional blogs, additional resources, and the recording of this webinar will be posted there in the next day. As you exit, there will be several survey questions if you can take a moment. We do value your feedback, and as I said, we are working on a list of frequently asked questions to answer those with the speakers and resources. Thank you all so very, very much for taking time out of your day. We so appreciate all you do for families.